Say hello to my little friend again. Welcome to Game Boy Works Volume 2. How would you two like to come to my house at the beach? Love oh. to! Game Boy Works, or Game Boy World, debuted 10 years ago this week. And not entirely by coincidence, the NES Works chronology has reached summer 1989, which brings us to, yes, the Game Boy's launch in America. Consoles always landed a little differently in America than they did in Japan back in the 1980s, except for Game Boy, whose US debut looked remarkably similar to its launch back in its home territory. Compared to other import consoles of the era, the NES, Master System, TurboGrafx-16, and Genesis, Nintendo localized the device almost verbatim and with very little localization gap. For starters, Game Boy showed up in both regions as, well, Game Boy. Game Boy! Compare that to the Famicom, which became the redesigned NES, the Mark III, better known as the redesigned Master System. The PC Engine, aka the redesigned TurboGrafx-16, and the Mega Drive, which Sega tweaked and rebranded as Genesis. But Nintendo simply called their handheld the Game Boy in all regions. That uniformity extended to the system itself. It didn't receive a facelift or redesign for the West, with the American and European devices looking identical to the Japanese machine all the way down to the branding and color scheme. And in a first for a localized Japanese console, all Game Boy cartridges worked on all Game Boy systems, regardless of the region in which any component originally shipped. This meant that Americans could play a Japanese version of Tetris on their consoles, and Japanese kids could play European exclusive Asterix games to their little heart's content. This made perfect sense, of course. As a portable system, Game Boy's designers didn't have to worry about television standards. No one had to convert the timing of games built for NTSC scan rates to PAL or deal with incompatible NTSC format RF channels. Everything the Game Boy needed in order to function was built right into the system. Besides batteries, of course, and even those came packed in with the American system. Aside from the manual and packaging text, the only real differences between the US and Japanese Game Boys was that the American system included batteries and a game, because the US market demands convenience and value in a way that other regions don't. We're a pushy lot, I'm afraid. And Game Boy's wholly integrated nature meant that kids, and adults, a key Game Boy demographic, would be taking their systems wherever they went. Yes, even abroad. The Game Boy was specially made for that meager 7% of Americans who actually used their passports. The cross-compatible worldwide cartridges and systems meant that an American kid who wanted to buy a copy of Dr. Mario from an airport kiosk at Charles de Gaulle in Paris could use it on the system their parents bought for them at a mega mall in Dubai. Game Boy was a revolutionary traveling companion with little in the way of direct competition for a traveler's attention. A portable gadget in an age before smartphones, PDAs, and practical laptop computers. Now, Game Boy wasn't the first handheld video game device by any means. Milton Bradley had beaten Nintendo to the punch by a full decade with its Microvision. Admittedly, the Microvision was the size of an Atari Lynx, but only came equipped with a monochromatic 16x16 16 16 pixel screen, so it didn't exactly set the world on fire. Nor did Epoch's Game Pocket Computer, a somewhat more capable device that arrived in 1984 with half a dozen games in tow and promptly vanished from the face of the earth. Game Boy wasn't even the most impressive handheld to debut in 1989. Atari shipped the Lynx right around the time that Nintendo's portable console arrived at US retail, and it made a far more stunning first impression at demo kiosks with its backlit color screen. However, Nintendo took the traveling companion concept seriously. Game Boy wasn't simply positioned as its owner's portable companion, but also as the companion to the Nintendo Entertainment System, and it drafted off the massive popularity of the NES to gain a quick advantage over the beefy Lynx. By 1989, the Famicom's dominance over the Japanese console market had begun to erode in the face of NEC's ascendant PC Engine, but the NES had arguably arrived at its peak popularity. Nintendo made it clear that the Game Boy didn't replace the NES, but rather complemented it. Although a few early Game Boy cartridges did come as something of an either-or proposition versus their NES counterparts, Tetris for starters, on the whole Nintendo took care to create a real sense of separation between the two devices. Game Boy boasted a library of first-party titles that reflected popular games on NES without duplicating them verbatim. Honestly, only a tiny fraction of the Game Boy's total library ended up suffering from the poor creative sense required to simply port an NES game over to the hardware directly, Capcom being perhaps the most egregious offender with games like DuckTales and the first few portable Mega Mans. For the most part, though, developers seemed to grasp the reality of Game Boy. 
namely that its lack of power and graphical finesse meant that it couldn't simply replace a console, and that its software needed to be specially tuned to work within the boundaries of the hardware. And so we ended up with games like Super Mario Land, which resembled Super Mario Brothers, but had a personality all its own, and Batman the video game, which played fast and loose with the licensed property in order to bring players a good, entertaining experience. When you wanted the real thing, you played NES or Super NES, or eventually Nintendo 64. When you wanted a quick fix, a hit of gaming satisfaction on the go, you picked up your Game Boy. Over time, this division of design did change somewhat. Developers gradually got a handle on converting full-sized console experiences into the portable format, which resulted in richer games like Metroid 2, Final Fantasy Legend 2, The Legend of Zelda A Link to the Past, and Wario Land. Additionally, Nintendo released a Super NES peripheral called the Super Game Boy in 1994, which anchored the Game Boy experience to a television. As portability potentially became a secondary consideration, substance became more of a priority in Game Boy software design. Of course, the best Game Boy software adeptly straddled the line between deep and disposable, somehow being both. Donkey Kong for Game Boy, for example, transformed the aging arcade game into a clever puzzle adventure containing a succession of bite-sized challenges, more than 100 of them to be precise. And then you had the US release of Space Invaders, which made use of Super Game Boy's most esoteric feature to present a simplified portable experience on Game Boy, and then loaded the actual Super NES ROM into memory when played on Super NES. And there was that whole Pokemon thing, a full-scale role-playing game whose core features could only work on a handheld system. Most people saw Game Boy as a secondary consideration throughout its life, a perception that Nintendo themselves built into the platform. But this second stringer reputation did mean that people tended not to take Game Boy seriously, and to regard its games as compromised substitutes, even when they weren't. Heck, even Nintendo's own marketing arm gave Game Boy short shrift. Nintendo Power Magazine didn't mention Game Boy once until the May-June 1989 issue, giving it a tiny quarter-page blurb in a magazine that hit right around the time of the system's Japanese launch. The following issue gave Game Boy a single page that included a brief synopsis of the system, its accessories, and a rundown of launch day releases with an emphasis on Tetris. It's a shockingly paltry amount of advanced press for a brand new game platform, a far cry from the deluge of teasers the publication unleashed for Super NES, N64, and even forget Virtual Boy. Especially when you consider that Game Boy would become the best-selling game system of the 20th century and more or less save Nintendo's bacon in the company's leanest years. The Game Boy received a proper introduction in the September-October 1989 issue, for a certain value of proper. The magazine's big blowout clocked in at a whopping eight pages, a fraction of the pages they devoted to any major 1988 or 89 release for NES that you care to name. This Game Boy feature devoted a handful of pages to the workings of the hardware and link options, relegating the other half of the article to Tetris, a game that would receive a cover and massive blowout in the following issue for the NES cart. And that's pretty much the NES Game Boy relationship in a nutshell. That subsequent issue devoted a whole six pages to Game Boy, cramming overviews of 16 games into that space, predominantly Super Mario Land. Unfortunately for any real substantial coverage of the platform, Game Boy fans would have to wait until 1991. Two Game Boy releases finally received cover features that year, the much-deserving Metroid 2 and the must-be-a-slow-news-month dud that was Mega Man and Dr. Wily's Revenge. And more importantly, Nintendo published several subscriber-exclusive Player's Guide compendiums in 1991, one of which devoted its entire length to showcasing dozens upon dozens of Game Boy titles. So if you ever wondered why the world was so slow to accept Game Boy as a legitimate platform, well, it all started here, with Nintendo. But you know what? The fact that no one took Game Boy seriously is exactly why it did so well, and survived for so long. Game Boy was a cheap, convenient little gadget that you could pick up and keep on hand as a time waster or boredom killer. Its games certainly didn't demand the kind of commitment as the sort of software you saw in consoles in 1989. I mean, compare the way Dragon Warrior worked compared to the Game Boy's first RPG, The Final Fantasy Legend. Dragon Warrior demanded long-term grinding and forced players to return to the King's Throne in order to save. Final Fantasy Legend skipped experience points entirely in favor of purchased upgrades and pure random chance, and it let you save the game anytime you wanted outside of battles. 
the compact, almost disposable nature of Game Boy made it unthreatening. Not just to casual users, who would happily pick up the handheld to kill a few minutes every now and again, even if they had zero interest in console games, but to Nintendo's competition too. No significant game company would bother to make a direct competitor to Game Boy for nearly a decade. You had your Watara Supervisions and Mega Ducks, sure. But in terms of major players, the Segas and Ataris and NECs of the world attempted to compete on a different portable level from Game Boy, offering up full power handheld consoles to their detriment. The Game Boy hardware avoided that pitfall. Nintendo didn't even try to make it a portable NES. Such a thing certainly would have been possible. After all, about a year after Game Boy's debut, NEC launched the Turbo Express. The Turbo Express shrank the actual TurboGrafx-16 architecture into portable form. The TurboGrafx-16, whose CPU was more or less a double-speed version of the same chip that powered the NES. There was nothing preventing Nintendo from shipping a full-featured handheld NES in 1989. Nothing, that is, except the company's keen instinct for hardware economics. Instead, Nintendo's design team took a different approach vector to the Game Boy. Instead of coming at it from the NES as its basis, they looked instead to Nintendo's existing portable legacy, the Game & Watch. And no surprise! The same team that had produced the Game & Watch line, Nintendo's R&D 1 division headed up by Gunpei Yokoi, tackled the Game Boy as well. Yokoi's particular genius for turning inexpensive existing mass-market components into vehicles for fun needs no rehashing at this point, and he commissioned his team to apply that philosophy to the handheld. Largely spearheaded by Yokoi's right-hand man, Satoru Okada, the Game Boy's design process made use of the cheapest components available. Rather than running on the NES's chip, a CMOS 6502 variant, Game Boy employed a derivative of the cheapest dirt Zilog Z80 that had previously powered the likes of ColecoVision, ZX Spectrum, and of course, Sega's SG-1000. That right there puts the whole thing into perspective. Sega upgraded the SG-1000 into the Master System by adding a powerful graphics processor upgrade while keeping the original Z80 chip, and the Genesis actually carried forward the core SG-1000 processing system into its 16-bit design. But that Z80 chip functioned as an embedded subprocessor for Genesis, performing secondary functions for the console's powerful Motorola 68000 CPU. The Z80 was so cheap to make, due to its age and popularity, that Sega found it cheaper to just transplant that entire system into its new console than to come up with a new mechanism for performing 8-bit backward compatibility, audio playback, and other functions. Likewise, the Game Boy screen targeted a balance between low-cost and acceptable shortcomings. The large backlit color screen epics used for Atari Lynx, whose designers had attempted to pitch that machine to Nintendo only to be rebuffed, looked great, but cost many times more than the 2-inch monochromatic STN that Nintendo ultimately went with. The Game Boy screen required very little battery juice to power, too, with a slow refresh rate and reliance on reflected light from external sources. It looked pretty lousy compared to any other game system on the market, but it gave you all the visual information you needed to see when playing Tetris or Alleyway, and it ran on four batteries for something like 20 to 30 times as long as the Lynx's six batteries could last. But note that Nintendo's use of inexpensive components didn't mean that the Game Boy felt cheap. Having found their first proper success in the world as a toy manufacturer, Nintendo knew precisely how rough kids can be on gadgets. They built the Game Boy's shell of a thick, rugged plastic, which could easily withstand careless handling or the occasional ballistic missile impact. Yet, they managed to keep the system's weight down in order to minimize player fatigue. Without batteries, the Game Boy actually weighs less than many Game & Watch models, such as the panorama screen units. And there's a spark of personal passion project powering certain Game Boy components too. R&D 1 composer Hirokazu Chip Tanaka supervised the design of the system's link cable and audio setup. Being a musician, Tanaka prioritized the system's audio capabilities. Although the Game Boy shipped with a single mono speaker built into it, the headphone jack could produce true stereo output. Nintendo even shipped the system with a pair of earbud headphones in all regions so that players could enjoy this feature. The Game Boy's stereo audio capabilities resulted in some interesting experiments, such as the Multimatrix Quad Stereo remixes, publisher Meldak incorporated into the multiplayer mode of Heianchio Alien. Even now, Game Boy lives on as a tool for musical artists. Live performance was a key feature that Analog promoted for their Analog Pocket Game Boy clone. The link cable would prove to be even more momentous than the stereo output. Right from the start, Nintendo pushed the ability to connect two systems for head-to-head -head play, 
Every launch title besides Super Mario Land and Alleyway revolved around competition. This was not a cynical ploy to sell more systems and games, though I'm sure that didn't hurt. The Game Boy was a personal game device with a small screen and limited viewing angle that only accommodated a single person. But by connecting two systems, players could potentially link up and experience a game their own way. The advantage this offered over traditional consoles, where players shared a single screen, should be self-evident. Think back to Sega's home Mahjong, which attempted to create a competitive Mahjong experience on a single screen by including an acetate screen divider in the box. Hardly a practical option. And cast your mind back to Nintendo's NES launch title, Tennis, which could only offer singles or doubles play, both versus the CPU, rather than a two-player competitive mode. Tennis could only be played against another player in its Arcade versus Tennis incarnation, which allowed arcade operators to connect two machines in order to give each side their own screen that put them in their respective forecourt. Game Boy Tennis uses the link cable to connect two systems and give each player an equivalent experience on the go. The Game Boy team had already experimented with different concepts for portable multiplayer gaming through the Game & Watch line. The Game & Watch Micro vs. line debuted in 1984 with Donkey Kong Hockey, a system the size of an eyeglass case which players could open to reveal two hardwired handheld controllers that allowed them to share a screen while controlling their characters individually. That concept wouldn't translate effectively to Game Boy, which took its design cues from integrated systems like the Donkey Kong Game & Watch. Instead, the Game Boy design team looked to the precedent of a higher-end 1984 release, the Computer Mahjong Yakuman system. Computer Mahjong Yakuman allowed two players to connect their standalone devices through a communications cable, playing head-to-head -head Mahjong with the crucial privacy of an individual screen, something impossible with traditional consoles. Computer Mahjong Yakuman sold for close to $150 per unit, but the concept translated neatly to Game Boy, which cost much less. That connection would have been potentially evident to Japanese consumers, since Game Boy launched with a head-to-head -head Mahjong title called Yakuman. But here in the US, we received neither the Yakuman handheld nor the cart. Competitive linking was just a neat thing we could do with our Tetris carts. Compelling as Game Boy's link cable proved to be, it once again left Nintendo a few steps behind the competition. Epix built the potential for up to eight players to connect their systems simultaneously, using a simple stereo-style cable rather than the finicky custom connector Nintendo designed for Game Boy. But not unlike the hooks for future expansion that Masayuki Uemura had required for the NES and Famicom hardware, the quirky open nature of Game Boy's communication protocol allowed Nintendo to catch up. The company released a four-player adapter in 1990, and the system could potentially support even more than that. In fact, just a few weeks ago, the Faceball 2000 fan community managed to get the Game Boy's Holy Grail up and running, a full 16-player match. The Game Boy may have been an exercise in cost management and technical compromises, yet somehow it still managed to run a first-person deathmatch shooter with as many players as Halo Combat Evolved. Of course, the Link Cable's true value wouldn't become evident until 1996, as the Game Boy entered its sunset days. As Nintendo scrambled to develop a powerful 32-bit successor in the wake of Virtual Boy's failure, while refreshing the Game Boy line with a life-extending hardware refresh, the Game Boy Pocket, they shipped a multiplayer RPG by developer Game Freak called Pocket Monsters, or Pokemon. Pokemon works perfectly fine as a single-player game in which you traveled the world and captured monsters to serve as your combat party, resulting in something like a cross between Atlas's Megami Tensei series and the bug-battling that Game Freak head and longtime games journalist Satoshi Tajiri grew up loving. However, much like real-world beetle combat, Pokemon thrived when you faced off against other players. The link cable allowed players to pit their monster rosters against one another, using a fairly complex system of comparative strengths and weaknesses, effectively rock-paper-scissors with five times as many factors, and a heavily customizable skill system with which to best one another. It wasn't all competition, though. Players could also connect in order to simply trade their creatures, allowing them to share monsters that appeared commonly in their own version of the game with players whose cartridge didn't normally give them access to those Pokemon. Pokemon became a phenomenon that still rules the charts nearly 30 years later, and it caused a sudden resurgence of Game Boy sales. In the US, Pokemon didn't arrive until the end of 1988, nearly a decade after the system's debut here an end-of-life shot on the arm that no other game platform before or since has enjoyed. But again, Game Boy could thrive beyond its reasonable lifespan because no one else had managed to compete with it. By the time Sega gave up on Game Gear, the 3D hardware race was in full effect, 
and the heavy emphasis on the utter importance of polygons to the future of gaming would have been complicated by a new portable hardware, which couldn't possibly have pushed PlayStation-grade graphics in the mid-1990s. Game Boy just kind of plugged away quietly in the background until Pokemon hit, which inspired a new wave of competitors. SNK responded by creating the Neo Geo Pocket, a beefy little system designed to capture the rock-solid feel of the company's arcade experiences in portable form, with lots of added collection-based hooks to recreate a touch of Pokemon Mojo in their handheld takes on Metal Slug and the King of Fighters. Meanwhile, Gunpei Yokoi retired from Nintendo after launching the Game Boy Pocket and quickly applied his design thinking to a new system for Bandai, the Wonderswan. Essentially a Game Boy on HGH, the Wonderswan offered far more power than Game Boy Pocket, supported orientation shifting like the Lynx, boasted stereo sound and widescreen graphics, sold for less than Game Boy, and ran for dozens of hours on a single AA battery. Nintendo responded to these threats to their portable dominance by revamping the Game Boy with a color screen and more powerful internals. Not the full successor that the mysterious Project Atlantis had been envisioned as, but rather an incremental bump with full backward compatibility. Game Boy Color played all original Game Boy software, as well as clear cart color exclusive titles and hybrid carts whose black shells indicated that they could run as monochromatic games on the old Game Boy models and even include Super Game Boy enhancements while enjoying visual upgrades on color hardware. Even though color exclusive games don't run on original Game Boy hardware, many people treat the Game Boy and Game Boy Color as the same platform, including Nintendo, which is how they managed to juice sales stats to come up with the fact that Game Boy outsold every other console of the 20th century, including PlayStation. However you parse it, the final monochrome compatible Game Boy cartridge, Pokemon Gold and Silver, shipped in the US in the year 2000 more than a decade after the console debuted. The final color game, Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets, shipped here in November 2002. By that point, the system's long-awaited successor, Game Boy Advance, had been chugging along here for a year and a half, with a second iteration, the illuminated Game Boy Advance SP, lurking in the wings for a spring 2003 launch. Nintendo would effectively retire the Game Boy name in 2008, following the launch of the final US Game Boy Advance release, Samurai Deeper Kyo. That's a nearly 20-year legacy for a single brand, a feat topped only by PlayStation and Xbox. Game Boy's retirement as a name seems like an inevitable turn of events. Reputedly coined as a riff on Sony's Walkman line, Game Boy sounds simultaneously gendered and diminutive, which probably accounts for the fact that it was never taken entirely seriously in the West. Nintendo finally managed to ship a Game Boy successor in 2004 with the DS, ironically enough, after pitching it not as a Game Boy replacement, but rather as a complementary system. After the complete failure of Virtual Boy to supplant Game Boy, Nintendo trod carefully in order to avoid another egg on face scenario in the event that DS died a shameful demise as well. But they needn't have worried. Despite a difficult start, DS ultimately found its stride once Nintendo figured out how to market effectively to the casual audience that had been so crucial to Game Boy's success. The DS, DSi, 3DS, and 2DS would keep the lights on at Nintendo headquarters during the lean years of the Wii U. But the line success meant there was no place in gaming for Game Boy, and Nintendo seemed perfectly happy to jettison a brand whose very name reinforced the notion that the company's games were only for kids, not serious gamers. Which isn't to say that Game Boy doesn't have the occasional place in Nintendo's business model. The 3DS supported dozens of emulated Game Boy, Game Boy Color, and Game Boy Advance titles through its virtual console. And they still offer the occasional little nod to their portable roots. We're still waiting on a classic Game Boy mini console, but at least Nintendo Switch Online features the occasional Game Boy release. Which is fitting given that Switch is basically the great 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 grandchild of Game Boy. Even if Nintendo doesn't want to do the hard work of maintaining the Game Boy's legacy, the system's fan base doesn't seem to mind keeping things going. In the decades since I originally kicked off Game Boy Works, the Game Boy fan scene has gone to town on preserving the system's legacy. Around the time Game Boy World debuted, people started rebuilding Game Boys with custom shells and biverted illuminated screens. Now you can drop in incredibly high quality aftermarket LCD screens, incorporate rechargeable US batteries, juice up the components with an almost endless array of custom colors, and more. No system seems to invite fans to go full ship of Theseus on their devices to quite the same degree that Game Boy does. And that's not even getting into cool utility add-ons like Alex Barr's BitBoy Drive, which allows Game Boy software to print to SD cards, or the GB Interceptor, which seamlessly outputs a Game Boy video stream via USB. 
And then you have the analog pocket and a growing number of similar high-end devices based around software emulation or FPGA-based hardware simulation. Newly designed handhelds capable of recreating the Game Boy experience almost flawlessly with modern components while doing much more, such as incorporating Super Game Boy features and supporting ROM hacks. And while the cost of complete in-box Game Boy games has increased by as much as 10 times over the past decade, which is why I can no longer afford to cover the system's entire worldwide library here, many of the games are still super cheap to pick up as bare carts. Whether you play them on pristine original hardware, a hacked vintage console, a gadget like Super Game Boy, in an emulator, through a clone device like Analog Pocket or Mister, the Game Boy library spans hundreds of titles, many of which hold up remarkably well despite their age and simplicity. Or, in some cases, entirely because of their simplicity. If Game Boy taught us anything, it should be that stripping games down to their essence isn't a bad thing. The best Game Boy developers weren't afraid to go minimalist, to fit within the limitations of the hardware. And the funny thing is, a game that's fun on primitive monochromatic handhelds with a barely legible screen ends up being pretty damn entertaining on more capable devices as well. So, happy birthday, Game Boy. At 35 years of age, you are now old enough to be president. And you certainly have my vote this year. Next time on Game Boy Works Volume 2, everything is falling into place. That's a Tetris joke, you know? <laughs>